We are reading today from Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. I don't know if you're watching your calendar, but I'm watching mine, and it is 23 days to Christmas. Man, we're, we're, we're fast counting down this thing. Today is the second. 23 days from now, we'll be eating the ham on the table, you know, and uh, celebrating, celebrating Jesus Christ. I, I just think it's really exciting. And uh, I thought, now is the time to get a sermon in about the birth of Jesus about you know that Christmas story let's 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 crack it open and have a look at it and I'm reading from Luke 1 verse 26 it says this in the sixth month God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a to a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David the virgin's name was Mary the angel went to her and he said Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Verse 31, You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be barren, is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Can you imagine with me put on your imagination for a minute imagine that you are mary right now you are face to face with one serious angel he is big he is all powerful and in fact he is unstoppable would you take your bible flick it one page backwards come down to verse 19 Look what Gabriel even describes himself as. Look, one chapter 1, verse 19. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I come to speak and tell you this good news. And we, we're not talking about little angel here. We're talking about number one, Gabriel. When you list the angels in order of authority, man, we've like got Gabriel. He's, he's up there. He, he says in verse 19, one page before, it's in a different story, but he goes, listen up, Zechariah, I stand in the presence of God. I don't doubt for a minute that Gabriel knew who he was. He knew his authority. If you, uh, if you know much about angels, a really cool verse that unpacks the whole angelic world is Hebrews 1 and verse 14. It says this, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? It's hard. You know, we talk about an eternal world and yet we live in a physical world. But I'll tell you, there is a spiritual dimension going on. There is angels. And right now we can see a very real story. This is no fairy tale. This is the real thing. And we've got one serious angel uh, standing in front of Mary about to deliver a message to her. Look at verse 31. The big serious angel says, Mary, you will be with child. Okay, Mary's doing the maths, right? Mary's not married. Mary's never slept with a man. 
she's doing the mass right now. It, mm, it's not looking. She just can't. You know, she's contemplating, right? You will be with child. And then he goes on and says other, other things. He says, in fact, it's going to be a son. Look at verse 31. You're going you're gonna to have a child. And not only that, you're going to have a child who's a son. Is the message from the angel. And he says to Mary, he says, Mary, if you feel like it, would you call him Jesus? No, he doesn't say that. He says, Mary, he will be called Jesus. And you will name him Jesus. You will give him the name Jesus. Now, you've got to remember that Mary is Hebrew. You know, she's Jewish. and She grew up in the culture. She knows what the name Jesus meant. Jesus meant God saves. Mary's looking at this unstoppable, serious angel. And the angel's going, call the boy God saves. Just imagine that you're Mary. You'd be going, wow, this is a lot to contemplate. Verse 32, angel says more to her. Unpacks the message. He says, he's going to be great. We, we go, oh, that's a great car. Oh, that's a great rifle. That's a great phone. We're not talking the same great here. We're talking great. You know, when, 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 Mary, when an angel says to Mary, he's going to be great. Ramp it up. You know, it's the original meaning of the word. He's going to be great. And then she goes on to say this. He goes on to say this to Mary. He goes on to say, he's going to be called the son of the most high God. And uh, can you imagine for a minute what it's like to have an angel speak that as a message to her? This week I heard a verse come across my mind. It was the ver I had to go and find it and complete it. It was the verse that said, of the increase of his kingdom, there would be no end. And you know when we think about Christianity, 2012, New Zealand, and we think, man, how many people actually believe in God? How many people actually care about God worldwide? And then you throw that in the face of that verse that says, of the increase of his kingdom. It's in Isaiah 9, verse 7. And it's a reflection of, of what we see here in verse 33 of our text of Luke 1, 33. It says here, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And, and, and if, you were, if you look where they got the root of that, of that text from, it, it, it is a, a repeat of Isaiah 9 verse 7, which says this, of the increase of his government and his peace, there will be no end. And I got to thinking about that. It just grabbed my mind. Christianity, year 2000, are we going backwards? No, we are not going backwards or the text is wrong. When God says of the increase of Christianity, of the increase of the kingdom of God, there will be no end. Nothing is going to stop it going forward. Nothing's going to halt God changing the hearts and the lives of people. I got to thinking, what does the government, what does the kingdom look like and i just sort of ran my mind for a while over over a little bit of christian ministry that i'd seen uh around the world and in different places i remember uh being a little uh Taupo apostolic boy and we used to get in these vans on a saturday early in the morning five o'clock and we used to drive down to rangipo prison and when we'd finished with rangipo we would go to how to and when we'd finish at how to we'd come back for another service and we'd get home at seven o'clock at night and we'd been in all these prisons and and we would sing and we would preach and we would tell testimonies there was never a day in those prisons when you didn't talk to some young guy uh tapped up his arm made a mess in life and yet now goes to chapel on a sunday in prison I remember being in Waikiria prison in the sexual offenders 
you know, they've got rubber gloves on, where they're serving us lunch. It is totally foreign. And yet we're sitting at the table talking to these guys. They've had a heart change. Some, some have come to repentance. They've, they've, their heart has changed. God takes out that criminal, defiled, sinful heart. He gives them a new heart. That's the kingdom of heaven. When God takes a sinner and makes them into a saint by faith, when they change their behavior, then you can see the kingdom of heaven. That's the kingdom that's never going to stop growing. My little boy said to me as we drove in a safari this week, this is Elijah. He says, uh, Dad, uh, which, which country's got the most Christians? And he's genuine in his question. Which country? And, and what he's really saying is, in per capita, which country has got the most Christians? And I started to tell him stories. I says, you know, in China, you can't really stand on a street corner and say, I'm a Christian. They'll put you in prison. And, and yet, if you talk to anybody who measures church population in China, uh, they cannot measure it in the thousands. They cannot measure it in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, they, are, they are scared to even put a low estimate in the millions and the millions and the millions of Christians who are in China. I was with a friend. He says to me, uh, you're going to be speaking at a Bible school today. And we're walking along the streets of China, you know. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, where's that? And um, he said, oh, see, see that window up there, the one with the flag in it? He says, that's the school. I said, oh, cool. And we get in this elevator and mm, up this, you know, apartment building. It's right. We go in this door. And there it is. We're in a Bible school. Metro China. That's the kingdom of heaven. It's it's expounding. It's growing. When it says here in, in verse 33, uh, it says, His kingdom will never end. It's, there wouldn't be a youth group in the nation which is not seeing kids give their life to Jesus this year. There wouldn't be a university campus ministry this year that didn't see um, uh, young people turn from drunkenness, wickedness, and debauchery unto Christianity. We just don't see it all here on a Sunday morning, but I can assure you uh, in New Zealand and across the nations of the world of the increase of his government and his peace, and according to verse 33 of his kingdom, it will never end. It is going on. Personally, I think that China will be one of the great world powers in the days ahead. I don't want to get all political on you here, but I think you'll find God is going to bust open China and there's going to be millions of Christians go out from China to preach the gospel. And we will see China with Christianity spreading out in the open before very long. And uh, I'm just trying to show you we kind of read that verse of the increase of his kingdom and we go, yeah, yeah, the kingdom of God. No, it's a real kingdom. It's people and the kingdom's built up of hearts that believe. That's really a clear definition of what the kingdom of heaven is. It's, it's a whole bunch of people with believing hearts following the Savior. I want to read to you, I had my message Bible open you know, when you, when you grab it open and you open to the book of Matthew or Mark or Luke in the message, Eugene Peterson's written a, a conclusion at the front just to get you rolling before you roll into it. And what he said just grabbed me. I'll read it for you. He says, the story of Jesus, think about the angel, think about Mary. The story of Jesus doesn't begin with Jesus. God had been at work a long time. Salvation, which is the main business of Jesus, is an old business. 
Jesus' birth was the coming together of God's salvation plan, which he had been planning before the foundation of the world. So when the angel comes to Mary and he says, you're going to have a baby. He's going to be the son of the most high God, of the increase of his, and all of these cool stuff. God just didn't think about it yesterday. This is the accumulation of God's salvation plan that he's been having in motion since the foundation of the world. It's just at this time that God announces it and throws it wide open to the world. Would you turn with me to Romans chapter 5? I want to show you of the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light where it started and why it was such a problem. Romans chapter 5, and we're reading verse 12. It says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, one man let sin into the whole world, and death through that sin, in another part it says, and death reigned through that sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sin. It's just like, whoa, darkness, light, kingdoms. When Satan was tempting Adam, he knew all too well what he was fighting for. God created this world. It was God's heart that everyone on the face of the earth would worship him, enjoy him, that God had this world planned out. It was going to be a wonderful underlined place. And Satan, he came to short circuit it. And through his tempting of one man, he took a legal hold. You need to understand it's legal through the sin of one man. When God said to Adam, Adam, if you touch, if you touch that, he doesn't say uh, you'll burn your hand. He says, Adam, you will die. But when Adam let sin into the whole world, he let death in and death reigned. And what I'm really trying to paint for you is the picture of the kingdom of darkness. The kingdom of light we talked about earlier. The kingdom of darkness came because one man let it in. And we followed his example thereafter. It says all had sinned at this point. And um, verse 18 uh, is, is the other part of the legal equation. One plus one equals two, you know. Verse 18, consequently. This is Romans 5 and verse 18. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men. And then a cool answer. This is what Christmas is about. So also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life to all men. For, for just as though the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many were made righteous. Adam let sin in. Sin was reigning. Satan had a legal hold and Jesus took it back. At, at the cross, it was fully paid for. We sung in that song this morning. I wrote it down. It says, you were as I, tempted and tried. And when I was thinking about the legal requirements, sin had to be paid for. God said to Adam, he said, Adam, if you touch that, you will die. That will be your punishment. You will die. Death. Okay? Now, Adam was dead now spiritually. All of Adam's children now were dead in spirit to God, cut off from God by sin. And yet we needed a solution. We needed a Jesus, we needed one who had uh, been tempted in every way. That's what that, what that verse in that song is taken from. It. The verse that says, you are as I tempted and tried. There's, the, the Bible says this, 
it says, Jesus was tempted in every way and yet didn't sin. And see, when Jesus is tempted in every way and doesn't sin and he goes to the cross, he is the sinless Lamb of God. He is legally, he is legally able to take the full punishment of our sin. And in Romans 6 verse 23, it says this, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the cool news is the kingdom of darkness took a big blow at the cross. Jesus took it back. We don't see it fully taken back yet because people haven't believed. But legally, Satan has no reign of darkness to hold a single person now away from the kingdom of light. Let's look back in our text today at verse 34. Luke 1, verse 34. Now we know the message that the angel gave to Mary. He says, and Mary says in verse 34, she goes, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. Now I got to thinking about this. I don't think for a minute that Mary's going, nah, don't believe you. You know that word, nah. We've got, it's kind of in society here. Nah. You know, oh, I got this thousand horsepower car. Nah, come on, man. You know, I don't think that Mary's going, nah. I think it's more like a logical inquiry. I, I, gave, I know he's big and he's got this cool message, but I don't have a husband. I, I never slept with anyone. And, and she goes on to say, how? how? See how that, it's, a, it's a logical, how righteously will this happen when I, when I don't have a husband? One commentary wrote it like this. How can this be? The question did not speak of her denial of the possibility of this thing happening. But it spoke of her wonder at the strangeness of the message. She doesn't say, this cannot be. But she says, how? How shall this be? She, she doesn't distrust, distrust the angel and demand answers. She just inquires. And uh, I just wonder if that would happen to us. How, how would we sort of respond? Would you turn with me to one page to the left? I want to talk about this guy called Zechariah. He gets visited by the same unstoppable, big, shiny angel. He hits the deck when the angel turns up to see him as well. And, and it says here in Luke 1 verse 13, the angel starts, you know, after it gets past the bit where he's gripped with fear and the angel starts to speak to him, right? Do not, verse 13, do not be afraid. Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you will give him the name John. He's the forerunner, right? He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will, it goes on to say what, he will never drink wine. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his birth. Many of the people of Israel, he will bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the, in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. And he will make the people prepared for the Lord. Look at verse 18 and I want you to draw a comparison. Two people meet one angel. Okay. First lady, think about her response. Now think about Zach. Zachariah, look how he answers the angel. Zachariah asked the angel, He's more of a nah guy. Nah, he's kidding. He goes, he goes, Zechariah asked the angel, verse 18, how can this be? I'm an old man. My wife is old, long in years. Can you see how he's talking to Gabriel? Can you see the, the comparison between how he talks to the angel and uh, how, how Mary talks to the angel? And look what happens to this guy. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news and now you will be silent 
and not able to speak until this day that this happens because you did not believe my words which came true, which will come true at their proper time. And Gabriel, he don't speak again to the point where they give him a tablet and they're arguing over which name to call his son. And he goes, it's actually in the now. He goes, his name is John. He doesn't say his name will be. His name is John. He writes and wow, he gets his voice back. But I want you to draw a comparison and I want you to think about your own life are you more like a Mary when God wants you to do something? When God starts to speak to you? I, do you go like Mary in verse 38? I am. I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, may it be to me as you have said. Is that speak more of you? Or are you more like Zach? Zach goes, oh no. He said how old my wife is. That's what he's saying. Hey, man, I got wrinkles, man. We, we're not going to be having, a, he's speaking to Gabriel like this, right? But Mary, she's got just as an impossible thing to believe. And she goes, wow, I'm contemplating it. May it be to me as you have said. I noticed two things about this too. Zach lost his voice. When he didn't believe, he lost his voice. Mary in verse 38, when she believed, uh, we don't have time, but she just bursts into song. She found her voice. You know, there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a rule going on here. Those who don't believe lose their voice to speak into community, into life, to friends. If you don't fully believe, it brings you to, to null. If you are like Mary, you don't quite understand how it all works, that God could change the heart of different people. Uh, but you say, I'm going to speak it anyway, and God will have to make it real to that person. Uh, you burst into song. And I know as we hit this Christmas, I want to be more like Mary and less like. I don't want to be a doubter. I want to believe even when the odds are high. I want to have a, a life and I want our church to have a, a life full of faith. Yes, we will believe and less full of, no, nah, that just looks too hard. And so I ask you as you head into this Christmas season, um, uh, do you believe? Do you believe that Mary's boy was the most high Son, come to earth. Do you believe that he has taken away the full sin of the world? And uh, how is our heart uh, with this message that we have?